This is Kirk Franklin, and I just want to say these damn kids don't appreciate shit. You just had to whoop their ass and kick them on their fucking neck and knock their motherfucking ass out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. This is Kirk Franklin. You listen to the X and Y show. The opinions expressed on the X and Y show are the sole opinions of the host. Please note, there is no intentional desire to offend any member of the listening audience. With that said, if you still feel offended, <laughs> tough shit. It's time for the X and Y show. With your host, Mr. Roosevelt. He talks about man topics, lady topics, and relationships. He talks about love, sex, and infidelities. He even gives good tips. There is no other show that compares to the X and Y show. Oh yeah, sit back, take your clothes off, and relax. It's time for the X and Y Show, where real relationship issues are talked about and addressed. The only place on the planet that tackles the topics that everyone wants to talk about, but no one is brave enough to address. Nothing escapes X and Y, baby. Now, here's your host, Roosevelt Colbert. <sighs> And greetings, 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 greetings. Welcome to another segment of the XY Show. I'm your host, Roosevelt. And we are, wow, September's already gone. October is the 22nd. We only got one more week in October. Next week is Halloween. I don't believe how fast this damn shit is going by. Now, you know how I feel about the Burr months. September, October, November. My birthday's in November. DM me um, I'll give you some good birthday gifts to get me um, <clears throat> And ladies I do take pictures <laughs> December is the favorite You know of course Christmas You know uh, that's uh, <laughs> That's the best holiday in the world So you you know I'm Already gearing up for that But um, I mean we're almost gone it's half, The bird months are halfway gone I can't believe this shit so it's a little sad, you know, uh, they're going by so fast, you know, because once Halloween goes, it's like Thanksgiving is warp speed, and next thing you know, Rudolph was on television. So, you know, if it was up, if it was up to me, it'd be Christmas for a month, you know, one day just not enough, you know. It'd be Christmas for a month, it'd be always like 35, 40 degrees outside, everywhere, in in the even in Nevada it'd be forty degrees. So you guys you lucky. I'm not controlling that shit. But um anyway, uh tonight's episode is a <clears throat> very serious episode that one I wanted to speak about and talk about for quite some time. I just never had the opportunity and just kept putting it off. Uh I don't know why. Um but anyway, I better late than never. I got around to it. So I wanted to talk about suicide. And suicide affects so many families, um, you know, across this planet. Because every nation has a problem with suicide. <clears throat> Some more than others. But, um, you know, I think it's a problem that definitely affects society as a whole. You know, rich and poor. Young and old, you know, famous, non-famous is something that affects everybody. So, you know, I think that if suicide or someone who is suicidal is caught early, perhaps they can be saved. You know, perhaps they can be taken back uh, from that dark place. Now, if you, those of you who been listening to my show, um, you know, I went through an episode myself. I never contemplated suicide, but um, I was extremely depressed about, uh, what was that, like 12, 13 years ago, somewhere around there. 
like around 2007 ish, eight to around there. So, uh, yeah, like 14 years ago, 13, give a little, take a little. <clears throat> well, at the time, I had three degrees, you know, had a uh, vast experience, and I could not find employment. And I became uh, my, my blood pressure. I never had high blood, high blood pressure. My blood pressure shot up because I was worrying, went through my savings. Um, I was pissed, you know, I was, I was fucking pissed. I was really pissed. Didn't want to see nobody. Um, you know, felt like a failure in front of my parents and, um, you know, it was other feelings. So it was depression as well, but you know, I didn't get to the point where I was contemplated suicide, but I think that, you know, a lot of people, um, unfortunately do, you know, where there's out of work or had an event, someone died or, you know, something drastic happened where they get to a certain state and they never come back. And that's how they end up committing suicide. They don't think <clears throat> the situation, whatever it may be, will get better. So they want to end it. And I think if we catch people in that stage before they get to that, where there's no return, perhaps we can save more people. So, you know, like I said, it happens to everyone, celebrities, non-celebrities, veterans. A lot of veterans commit suicide, especially if they, um, you know, suffer from PTSD. Um, And definitely no one is doing enough for veterans. But... No one is getting the help that they need. But even if they were offered the help, would they take it? So I think <clears throat> society as a whole have to learn how to say that, you know, getting help is okay. You know, you're not crazy. You're not weak. You're not a failure. You just need help. Is there, you know, everyone needs help sometimes, no matter how strong you are. No matter how good looking you are, no matter how ugly you are, you know, no matter how skinny you are, no matter how fat you are, everybody needs help. And I think as a society, what I believe, this is my opinion, of course, um, I think that is such a stigma, negative stigma with getting help that people who need it don't get it or they don't, they don't get it in time. And as a result, you know, they are no longer with us. So, you know, <clears throat> I just want to do my little piece, you know, um, and speaking about this topic is very important to me. Um, and it affects a lot of people. So um, I <clears throat> hope you enjoy my conversation. I'm talking to a Dr. Lena Haji um, from Miami, Florida. She's a clinical psychologist. <clears throat> And um, she's an expert on the matter. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with her. And please send me any feedback. Um, I will leave her notes on the episode as well. So if you need someone to talk to or need to refer someone, I'm sure she'll be happy to help you. Without further ado, here is the episode. Welcome listeners to the X and Y show. Um, this is your host, Roosevelt. Um, this is a very... Uh, sensitive topic to me Um, something I wanted to speak about for quite some time I don't know why it took me so long but um, better late than never Um, this is a very important topic Um, I'm talking about suicide and I would like to talk about um, ways that uh, a person can be um, identified as being suicidal and to prevent them from doing it. And also, why? Why would a person take their lives? What is so bad um, where they have to take their lives? And to help me with this, I'm talking to Dr. Lena Haji. She's a clinical and forensic psychologist. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. This is a really interesting topic. Yes, yes, indeed. Nice to have you. Now, speaking from a personal point of view, you know, when I heard about uh, 
people committing suicide, especially rich people. Um, mm. The first thing that comes to my mind, you know, why in the fuck would someone kill themselves uh, worth, you know, millions of dollars, uh, celebrities, um, you know, pretty much people who so many other people would like to be, you know, athletes, uh, movie stars, you know, all of that. Now, right. I, I used to think that way until um, I guess I went through a bad time in my life. Now, I wasn't suicidal, but mm-hmm. I was extremely depressed because, um, you know, my problem was, you know, little. I just couldn't find a job. But still, mm-hmm. you know, it was, this was about 15 years ago. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in Miami at the time and I'm here with, mm-hmm. I was there with three degrees and could not find, <laughs> I couldn't find a custodial position and, you know, wow. you know so, but I kind of understood why people would go that route. Mm-hmm. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, what exactly causes a person to want to end it all you know what 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 is it i know depression is one because i was extremely mm-hmm. depressed um but it was not to the point where i wanted to kill myself but i think um and correct me if i'm wrong um when someone stays depressed for a long amount of time that's when they become suicidal correct um, could be. Sometimes it can be an impulsive decision. I think it's it's interesting that you had the theory that people who are rich and famous and seem to have everything, you know, on the outside would be less prone to suicide. And that's you're thinking, well, they're, they're rich, they're beautiful, they're, they can have whatever they want. And, you know, they're out here living their best life. But I guess the bottom line is we really never know what somebody's going through internally. Um, and you know, that age old saying money can't buy happiness. Um, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I believe that I think, I think if anything, somebody who has everything that you think that they would want in terms of external factors, money and cars and yes, men, people kind of around them, but you still feel that internal void, it almost could make it worse because you're, you're trying to get your hands on all these external things and they're not filling that internal void. So, you know, to, to think that um, people of different socioeconomic status would be less prone to suicide, I guess there's some research to show that, you know, more impoverished people are more likely to commit suicide, but it definitely doesn't protect somebody from suicide 100%. Um, and what would cause somebody to commit suicide? I think depression is, is um, you know, a, a big a big one. Uh, also, uh, suicide risk factors include things like addiction. So sometimes someone might not be depressed, but feel that they can just not let go of addiction and addictive behaviors. And so they might impulsively say, I can't do this anymore and take their own life. Um, active military members and veterans have a high suicide rate because of, uh, you know, trauma, mm-hmm. trauma that, that might still be affecting them. You have uh, people who are feeling very hopeless and helpless. You mentioned that you felt that way a little bit when you were unable to find a job in spite of having three degrees. So if somebody feels like their future is simply just not going to get better, no matter what, there's no kind of light at the end of the tunnel, they might get to a place where it's like, well, why am I even bothering? Let me just end this now. Um so those are some of the risk factors, feeling isolated, people who are very lonely and don't feel connected to their com- community. They might have a very limited social support network, maybe no friends or no family or very little friends or family. You know, this is a big, scary world. And if you feel alone in it, that could also be a factor for suicide. So there are a lot of different things when you look at risk factors for somebody to you know, engage in kind of suicidal behavior or have suicidal thoughts. Um, I hope that makes some sense. Yes, it does. And, 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 and that's funny you say that because, you know, when I was going through that episode, 
um, you know, I, I thought I had an X amount of friends and that was not the case. You know, I just had a bunch of mm. uh, associates and, you know, basically just, uh, you know, a bunch of motherfuckers I used to go to school with or we used to work right. with, you know, they were not friends. Um, I did have family, you know, my mom and dad was, uh, you know, good family. I have, I have siblings, but, you know, I, I couldn't talk to them about the, the way I was feeling. You know, I was feeling like, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I was feeling like a failure. You know, I'm, here I am with three degrees at the time and can't get a job at a ice cream uh, place. And, right. uh, you know, I felt like a, a, a failure. I was embarrassed. You know, I didn't want to mm-hmm. see anyone. <laughs> you know, it was terrible. So, um, yeah, it sounds like there was a lot of shame. And that's something that, you know, we need to really battle as, as, as fellow as fellow humans. You know, that there, you know, everybody goes through hard times and trying to eliminate that shame factor. Um, but it makes sense, you know, you, you, you felt a certain way about yourself, so it got you down. That makes a lot of sense, you know? Right, right. You know, and, and you know, looking back, you know, I'm older now, more mature, and um, I should have, you know, I'm, I'm a veteran. I, I could have gone and gotten therapy, <laughs> mm-hmm. but, you know, but I look at, you know, I know you're a psychologist. Don't take this personal, <laughs> <laughs> but I I look at therapists you know uh, like they're all full of shit you know they can't right. they, they can't help me you know I just, i'm just gonna right. lay on a couch and uh you know tell them my problems and they can't really help me so i thought it it was a useless thing to do um but that was wrong i know um, and i think that's what a lot of people who are going through whatever um they don't get the therapy, you know, that they need to kind of bring Mm -hmm. them out of that. Correct. No, I totally agree. And I see where you're coming from. And even as a psychologist myself, I've, I've certainly felt that way when I've had low times in my life, like, well, you have all the book smarts. So what is somebody else going to fucking tell you that you don't already know, you know? (laughs) So you're, you're, and and you're not alone in feeling that way. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there are, there are a lot of people that are like, what, what is telling my problems to somebody else possibly going to do for me? You know, and, and a lot of you have some book smart therapists who you think have no life experience, but the the bottom line is even just talking to somebody who, who, you know, has studied this and, and obviously I'm biased because I'm in the mental health field, but I, I feel where you're coming from because I've had that same kind of, kind of thought myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it, to, to realize that people, in mental health are typically, you know, you have bad apples in every kind of profession, but are typically trained to, to actively listen and actively help you change your perspective and help with your mood and your behaviors and your thought process in a non-judgmental way. You know, that's the key to build like an empathic relationship in a non-judgmental way. Um, and I get that, you know, I worked in prison for 20 years. And so I'm talking to you know, murderers and rapists and gangbangers. And they're looking at me like, okay, you're going to come up in here and you're going to think for one second that you know what the fuck I'm going through. And I get that. I have to, I have to respect that. I have to come at them with a respect that like, look, I'll never know what you're going through. Of course, I don't know what it's like to be locked up away from my family, you know, loss of freedom. That doesn't mean that I can't still come at you from a different perspective and kind of help meet you where you're at and see how we can do this together. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, those who think, you know, oh, I went to school and I have degrees and I know better than you. That's not the right way to come at anyone, really. So I, I get that that point of view for sure. And I've had to deal with it from me personally and professionally, you know, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and it's also embarrassing, you know, uh, I, mm-hmm. don't, I don't want to be, uh, going on the couch and you know, leaving the, the office and thinking the doctor's saying this crazy motherfucker, you know, you know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was worrying about the wrong things, but you know, that's what I was worried about. That's why I didn't seek help. And that's why a lot mm-hmm. of people who are going through some things, you know, whether it's can't find a job or divorce or whatever is getting them down. Um, that's why they don't seek help because, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to go talk to a 
quote unquote shrink. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Or as a total stranger at that. I mean, why would you, you know, why would somebody think I'm going to go tell all, fill all my problems to a total stranger and this person is supposed to help me? Exactly. That makes total sense. That makes total sense. Um, I think what it is, and, and, and you talked about embarrassment and kind of shame, um, you know, like kind of, I'm a, you know, we live in a very machismo society and that doesn't just pertain to men, but also women, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, kind of get over it, you know, get yourself together. But when you're really clinically depressed, we need to realize that that's something that goes, it's like anything else. It's like diabetes. It's like cancer. It's, it's, it's a change in your brain where you need actual professional help in order to come out of that. So I, I think a big part of suicide prevention is really breaking that stigma, um, that kind of embarrassment and shame of, of, damn, I don't want to enter an office and talk to some strange person who just read a bunch of books and tell them my problems. How are they going to help? Right. But it makes sense, right. you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and that's kind of what I want to help do, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm I'm all right now. You know, I'm, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm not uh, depressed. I'm, I'm I'm good now. I'm working and got a good job and stuff. But you know, and that's something that I also want to get across that you know it does get better. You know, you, you can't stay mm -hmm. fucked up forever. You know, you're gonna find mm -hmm. a job. You're gonna find another girlfriend. Or, you know, you're gonna find another boyfriend. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's not gonna stay fucked up forever. Um, and that's the right. the key, you know, where we just, uh, some people just, you know, I can't take this anymore and they just check out and, um, you know, right. they don't give it a chance to get better. So, right. And I think that's also part of the, 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 you know, the mental health provider's job is kind of helping the person come to a place where they see some kind of hope at the end of the tunnel. You know, even if you have legal problems or financial problems or, substance abuse or, or, or like you said, divorce or breakup, things that, you know, a lot of almost all human beings have, have gone through or some kind of difficulty in their life. Um, that's another thing, you know, people think mental health professionals have never gone through difficulties. Most of my colleagues went into the profession because they were trying to figure themselves out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so we all have our own stuff that we've had, you know, traumatic childhoods or financial difficulties or, you know, aggressive behavior, substance abuse, all that kind of stuff. And so I think the key is to help that person come to a place where to instill some hope, you know, like you might not have a job right now. You might feel like you can't talk to anybody right now. Right. You might feel embarrassed and useless right now, but how can I help you today feel a little bit less of those things so we can get you to a place where you realize this isn't how it's going to be forever and ever. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's the important thing. Um, you know, and, mm -hmm. I, and I know that now, you know, I just wish I would have right. known that, uh, you know, 15 years ago, but, um, right. So tell me this doctor, um, you know, I used to live in Alaska, right. Um, and I know oh, wow. you being in the, uh, uh, you know, mental health field, you know that the suicidal rate in Alaska is extremely high. Um, mm -hmm. If you didn't know it, it is. Um, it's, uh, I did actually. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, especially if you live out in the boondocks, uh, like, you know, like, right. like the bush, they call it. Um, so, you know, I, when I stayed there, this was like, uh, I don't know, 18 years ago, something like that. <clears throat> and there was this guy that I worked with. He was a good guy. And uh, we worked um, for about uh, together for about two years, and then one day he didn't show up to work, and so you know everyone figured that he was calling out sick, you know. Then it turned into a week, you know. Then it turned into two weeks. So finally, uh, they went to check his home, and he had committed suicide. Hmm. And this guy was, uh, you know, I guess the tears of a clown type thing, you know, mm. you, you never thought that this guy would kill himself. I mean, he always seemed happy. Um, always, uh, you know, he was very successful, you know, um, he was a leader in the organization. Um, you know, he had everything from the outside. So I guess my question is, you know, I, I used to sit right next to this guy and I didn't mm. suspect anything. You know, he looked normal to me, you know, Everyone has their good days and bad days, but he didn't look 
suicidal. So I guess my question is, how can you tell if someone is suicidal or can you tell if they don't communicate with you in that way? That's a really great, great question. And, 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 you know, there's mixed research on, on, on a lot of suicide and I'm, I'm looking up some research right now, actually on, on the uh, suicide rate in Alaska being like, you're right. It's much higher than the national average. And they're saying it's a combination of factors due to there's a lot of firearms. There's high rates of alcoholism. There's low vitamin D deficiencies, feelings of isolation. So there's a big, there are a lot of reasons why the suicide rate is um, higher in Alaska. And so when we're trained as mental health professionals uh, in suicide risk assessment, as they call it, you know, we, we we're trained to look at three things. Is there ideation? Has there been, in, in other words, have there been thoughts of suicide, ideas of suicide? Is there a plan? Has the person actually made a plan? I'm going to take a bunch of Tylenol or I'm going to get a gun or I'm going to you know, do such and such. And then is there intent? So those three things. Intent is I, I really plan on doing this. You know, if I don't get this job or if my ex doesn't come back, I'm going to do this. So those are three of the things that we are trained to look for, ideation, plan, and intent. But as you mentioned, what if the person doesn't verbalize it? What if the person doesn't talk about it? What if the person is just suffering in silence? Because, you know, a lot of times people will commit, well, a truly, truly suicidal person won't tell anyone. Right. They'll just go and do it. And then everybody will be like, what happened? I thought they were, they were fine. That's horrible. Right. So I think there are some more subtle signs that we can look for in people who might not come up to somebody and say, hey, look, I've been having these thoughts. Because like you said, there's a lot of shame in that and embarrassment and how do I tell that to somebody? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the more subtle signs of suicide, we really want to take what's called a biopsychosocial model, which means we're looking at biology, we're looking at psychology, and we're looking at sociology. So if you're looking at the biological model, do they have any medical issues? You know, are, are we aware of any medical problems or, you know, are they, have, are they prone to sickness, anything like that? Uh, low vitamin D is shown to cause depression or there are certain biological things that can cause depression and suicidal thoughts. Then we want to look at the psychological, you know, is this person isolated? Are they using any kind of drug or drugs or alcohol? Do they have a trauma history? Do they have social support? Do they have family and friends? All those kind of psychological factors. And then again, the sociological factors, are they in an impoverished neighborhood? Are they in a neighborhood where they have no access to resources? Are they lacking health insurance? Are they kind of somebody who wouldn't really go to therapy? Um, and then you look for more specific signs. So a big one for at risk for suicide is somebody who starts to give away all of their belongings, especially in prison. Mm. So you'll see inmates who will all of a sudden, they'll be in a good mood. They won't seem depressed because they've already made the decision. That's another thing. When people firmly make the decision to commit suicide, they actually won't look depressed they'll look happy because they're at peace with their decision. So you see people giving stuff away, giving away clothes, giving away belongings, giving away. Well, why are they giving this stuff away? Well, because they don't plan on being here much longer. So that's a subtle sign of suicide. Is this person isolating more? Are they ignoring text messages and phone calls? Check on your people. You know, you talked about having acquaintances from school that were never really friends. And I think we, in, in today's world, we see that a lot. Well, we think we have friends and then when shit hits the fan, it's like, well, damn, where are my people? You know, <laughs> right. check on your friends, call on them. Hey, how you doing? You know, just be an ear for them. You know, you don't have to be a shrink. Just kind of say, tell me what's going on. Right. You know, are you eating okay? Are you sleeping okay? Are you working? Are you hanging out? Are you exercising? Are you, all that kind of, you know primary stuff that we, we forget about. So there are some more subtle signs that we can look for in suicidal people. Do they have a history of suicide attacks? Do they have a history of trauma? Uh, or do they seem to be drinking or drugging a little bit more than usual? All those kind of things, you know, that, that we should kind of look at for as red flags. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and now you mentioned three stages. So let me, Mm -hmm. If they get to, if they have all three stages, is it possible mm -hmm. um, to bring them back um, for, you know, because I've heard about people who committed suicide, well, not committed, but attempted to commit suicide and, you know, they were saved or whatever. And um, later on, they, they did it again and were successful. 
So is it possible right. once they get to that last stage to bring them back, like for long term, you know, or once they get to that third stage, it's just a matter of time? You know, that's a really great question. You know, I'm a firm believer in, uh, even though I'm a New Yorker, so I'm a little skeptical and pessimistic, and I worked in prisons for so long that I tend to be, you know, glass half empty kind of person. Right. At the end of the day, I'm a psychologist, so I'm in a, I'm, I really do firmly believe that there's always hope. You know, we're in a time where, where I, I really do believe there's always hope. There's so many different kinds of therapies, so many different kinds of interventions. And if you have to go to medication, you know, I'm never going to say no to medication to somebody who really needs it right. because a clinically depressed person, they literally, their brain is literally different. You know, there's serotonin levels and dopamine levels are not producing kind of like a diabetic with insulin. There are so many different kinds of medications. There's different kinds of, uh, of, of, uh, interventions, there's ketamine treatment, there's transmagnetic stimulation, there's electroconvulsive treatment. There's so many different kinds of treatments that I'm, I'm going to say, unless you've exhausted literally every single one, which is hard to do, I'm going to say there's always hope. You know, really, and also individualizing treatment. You know, one person might be suicidal for a way different reason than another person is suicidal. Right. You know, one person might be suicidal because they they live in the hood and they're tired of seeing the violence and they're they're they don't have enough to eat they don't have their basic needs met whereas another suicidal person you know they could be the rich and famous person who just can't stop drinking right. or or they've just gone through a divorce and they're feeling completely helpless and isolated so to really individualize when you assess somebody but do i think you can bring somebody back when they have ideation plan and intent I absolutely do, you know, and, and, and sometimes it's not pleasant. Sometimes do you have to call 911 or call 988 or get that person involuntarily psychiatrically hospitalized? Unfortunately, yes. But if it's for their safety versus them taking their own life, you know, those are things we have to weigh out. Right. Okay. Well, that is good news because, you know, I, I always yeah. <laughs> believed, you know, once they go past a certain point, that's it. You know, they, they can't be right. saved. So that's good. That's good. That's good to hear. So, you know, with as far as um, society as a whole, you know, mm -hmm. what can we do? Um, you know, everybody, you know, me, you, um, uh, every generation, all of them, generation X, Z, Y, the millennials, um, <laughs> you know, the boomers, you know. What can we do as right. a society to address this issue where, you know, it's like polio, where you hardly ever hear about it now? What can we do? Right. You know, um, I keep, you know, people always saying like, you know, doing COVID times, uh, providing more psychiatric help, you know, but, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, you can have all of the psychologists in the world, but if no one is going to see them, then it's not True. helping, you know? So what can we do to, to, you know, help this problem in our, you know, world? I, I, yeah. I think that's a really good point. You can have, you know, all the therapists lined up, but if nobody's willing to talk, then there's no point. But I think there's so many things that we can do. I, I really do. I think, you know, simply talking about it, like what you're doing today is, 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 you know, great. It's, it's something that's being done, you know, for free. And, and it's, it's being information that is being spread out. So yeah, podcasts, social media, YouTube, television, streaming services. We have so many ways of communicating things these days that even though there's a lot of misinformation out there, the good news is that technology has made it so that we can talk about stuff. And so people can feel less alone because a lot of times when people are suicidal, they think they're the only person in the world who has felt this way right. or who is struggling. And that's just simply not the truth. A lot of people deal with suicidal thoughts and clinical depression. And so I think also addressing the bare minimum for low socio socioeconomic um, populations, you know, are people, are people eating? Are people drinking? Do they have a roof over their head? And that's more systemic. And sometimes we feel like, well, damn, that's way over my head. You know, what can I possibly do? You know, well, mm -hmm. vote, you know, vote, uh, do some community, you know, do some community action, uh, go volunteer at your local shelter. You know, those bare minimum things, you know, we have to stop being so selfish. Um, of course, then more systemic things like, like making sure people have access to mental health, um, 
and, and starting early, you know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine a while back who's a principal in an urban school, and he told me that, you know, their budget for mental health is $1,200 a year for 500 kids. Wow. And that's crazy. $1,200 a year, what are you supposed to do? Run two therapy groups for 500 kids? You know, we need to make sure that it starts early. There needs to be school counselors for these kids who might be having these thoughts. Um, promote connectedness, you know, peer programs and free sports and free art and free music in your local to make people feel connected. And right. then, you know, teaching coping skills and problem solving, um, you know, that, that takes, uh, that takes, you know, an hour a day, half an hour a day to teach young people or, or even, even middle-aged or even older people, you know, nursing home people, you know, coping skills like, okay, you're feeling down. What can you do? Something as simple for, as going for a walk, which is free, which sounds so corny. You know, it sounds like an Instagram quote. Oh, you feel <laughs> down, go for a walk. But all jokes aside, if you can somehow help somebody just get up and walk out in the sun, that can actually have a positive impact on their mood or they might see other humans or they might feel the sun. Um, crisis intervention, you know, the, the coming out of 988, the crisis hotline, that's a step in the right direction. And I think, you know, education, 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 you know, and if you feel that somebody you know or love is in danger, don't be scared. You know, they might hate you for a second if you tell somebody, but at the end of the day, you might be saving someone's life, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's, yeah that's very important. You know, we're about the consequences or how they feel later. <laughs> you know, Right, they're, they're, right. They're because alive. believe me, I've had to, yeah, I've had to baker act patients that they hated me for days and weeks and months and and you know I, I i'm okay with being the bad guy i'm okay with being the bad guy for a while if i know that i saved somebody's life you know that's okay well, like you said we'll do, we'll deal with that later right <laughs> exactly the, the 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 goal was achieved you know of getting them right just, uh, making them stay here a little while longer you know and hopefully right. it gets better where they don't want to do that anymore so right all right, well, Doctor, well, thank you for um, con, uh, you know, having a little conversation with me. Now, you have a practice, right? I do have a practice. It's called uh, Rise Psychological Services. It's based in Miami. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of uh, forensic and clinical psychological evaluations. I don't do therapy and treatment so much anymore. I do more evaluations. Um, but, uh, yes, that's the name of my practice. And how would they contact you if they want to talk to you? So they can go to my website. It's www.risepsychological.com. I also have some uh, informational stuff on my social, on my Instagram and my YouTube, which is under the same um, name, Rise, R-I-S-E, Psychological Services. Okay. And um, yeah, they can find all my contact information there. Sounds great. So I hope uh, someone, you know, if it's just one mm -hmm. person, uh, here's uh, this podcast episode that they, uh, you know, contact you or someone that can help Agreed. You, you know, and that's the goal that I had. Agreed. Today, you know, so thank you. I, 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 and I appreciate what you're doing. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have to, like you said, we have to talk about this more, you know, so people become yes. more comfortable in getting help, you know, and uh, correct. Cause you know, you think about all the people that, we perhaps that that could have been saved if they you know mm -hmm. felt you know if it was like nothing to go see a therapist you know like you you know when you want to drink you right go, you go to the bar you get a drink you know and, well, you're right right you know so. if you have the flu and you feel like you you know if you have a virus you go to the medical doctor well exactly. if you have a mental illness or you feel sick you know you go to the mental health health doctor we're not there yet but i think we're on our way you know we, i think we're on our way i think people are really are starting to realize wow this is a big deal especially after covid like you said where people were isolated and feeling lonely and depressed and not knowing what to do with themselves it was a huge spike in people reaching out for mental health and so that's that's a good sign. Mm, yeah absolutely i mean and that's the key you know once you get them there um you know that's mm -hmm. that's half the battle you know Right, it's like going to the gym. Nobody wants to go to the gym, but once you get there, you're like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 no matter what it is, legs or you know, all, you know, yeah. Once right. You, once you get right. there, it's easy. You know, not easy, but yeah. right. <laughs> right, but it's half the battle. Exactly. <laughs> all 
All right, well, Doctor, I appreciate you talking to me today, and then uh, you, yeah, you. Well, I'm from Miami, um, so if uh, I oh, come cool. on, yeah, I come on periodically. I went to Killian. Uh, I don't know if you. Oh, that. cool! You're a real Miamian. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I come on periodically, but I live in uh, Fort Myers now. So, um, oh, you guys got hit bad. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. Um, I live on the second floor, so I didn't get any flooding or anything so okay so uh, but yeah i've lived around people that uh you know um, other neighborhoods that lost everything so yeah um, i have friends up there that lost uh, quite a bit bit uh, horrible yeah yeah so that's um and that's something that people need therapy for you know Um, correct correct because that can turn into some serious trauma right there losing everything from one day to the next that's really hard it's very hard so i mean Mm-hmm. Uh, so hopefully someone hears this and uh, if you ever come to Fort Myers uh, you know take out for some chicken wings or something I don't know if you're a vegetarian oh yes I- I'll take you up on that for sure I'll take you up on that for sure <laughs> I used to be the clinical director at Charlotte Correctional Institution right there in Cusa Gorda oh, oh okay yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. okay cool Just so you know the area yeah. okay yeah uh, yeah yeah just shoot me but you know just shoot me give me a day shoot me an email and yeah we we'll, you know, give me a, a you know a little advance notice, and yeah, go get some wings, some chicken wings, or something. something. I will do. I will do. <laughs> All right, well, Doc, thank you for talking to me again, and I really appreciate thank it. You. And um, you know, I really hope that someone hears this and uh, you know uh, go get the help that they they need. You know, that's the key. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, because it does get better. So. It does get better, and I appreciate everything you're doing. It's it's really important, so thank you. All right, Doug. You have a good night. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The X and Y Show with your host, Roosevelt Colbert, the place where real relationship issues are talked about and addressed. Join us next time. You can now put your clothes back on or not. Uh.